Regarding our oceans, coral reefs, ocean acidification, what are these? How is climate change affecting it? And how does this affect us? I, I, did, read, I did hear someone once say that we get um, our oxygen from the ocean, or, and that if the ocean dies, we don't have all this oxygen. So could you explain why ocean, what ocean acidification is, how it affects the ocean, the fish, the coral reefs, and, um, and why this is something that we should be concerned about if, if that and forests are the main producers of oxygen? Um, there's some notes that I have. In December, a study showed the planet's oceans are rapidly deoxygenating, de with some areas in the tropics having already lost 40 to 50 percent of their oxygen. Uh, land, another landmark report showed no matter how much emissions are cut, extreme sea level events that used to occur once per century will happen every single year by 2050. Um, that's uh, the last six years in a row, each successive year has been a record warm year for the oceans. Um, the second big factor in sea level rise behind melting ice is thermal expansion of the oceans as water warms, it takes up more space. 93.4% um, of all the heat that we've added to the atmosphere has been absorbed into the oceans, half of that since 1997. You're not going to get that heat out of the oceans. That's why I feel confident in saying that we are we have a minimum of 3C warming that's already baked into the system. Um, and that's what we have to start preparing for and adapting for. Um, acidification uh, alongside that, the oceans are dramatically absorbing uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. And that's why we have, literally, I saw a, a study up from where I live in the Pacific Northwest, that the shells of Dungeness crabs are literally dissolving. Now, that's how much the acidification is impacting where I live up nearby Seattle. So that's a huge problem. And a 2011 NOAA study warned that at current trajectories of warming and other factors, that by 2050, it was possible we wouldn't have any functional coral reefs left on the planet. And several of the scientists I interviewed for the coral reef chapter in my book um, said that they thought that study was far too conservative, that it would, it would happen long before then. And we just have to look at the Great Barrier Reef um, as example, which I also wrote about, where um, one of the most shocking things I saw recently on that, aside from the fact that last several years in a row it's seen major coral bleaching events, but um, uh, when was that? Uh, anyway, it was sometime this fall, a study was published showing that the reef had suffered an 89% of collapse in new coral after its bleaching events of 2016 and 17. So that means that as the reef dies, it's basically starting to not come back. And many of the leading scientists studying the reef in Australia don't expect it to be there by 2030. And that's the single biggest coral reef on the planet. So that gives you an idea how fast things are, are changing in the oceans. Do you see any positive signs in terms of grassroots organizing that is making a difference? Give us a little bit of hope, maybe, that, that somebody's going to lead us out of this? Well, um, one thing that I, a very interesting trend that has, it's, it's been in motion, but it, I've seen it highlighted even in a Guardian story today about, uh, what Aboriginal people are talking about in Australia. And they're basically saying, look, if you had, we have been stewards of this land for tens of thousands of years, and uh, granted, they didn't have climate, the climate crisis like we've generated, but um, there's literally been areas in Australia right in the middle of where fires were that didn't burn at all. And it happened to be land that was managed by Aboriginal people, and it's because they knew how to be stewards of the land and take care of it in a way so that it wasn't set up when wildfires came through that this would happen. And so uh, there's indigenous-led movements already in the states. I know of one, for example, a, a, a good friend of mine in California is tracking, who's also, a, he's a Native American elder of 
seed planting where native youth or and when I say youth, I, it's all relative, right? So people in their 20s or 30s are, are um, getting seeds that they know need to come back or need help migrating further north but as temperatures change. And they're literally already just doing it. And, and, and I know literally these like gorilla seed planting operations, not by the native people, but I know other non-native people that literally are just, look, government's not gonna do it, so we're gonna just start doing it. And they're going up on both public and private lands wherever and just helping plants migrate and stay ahead of the game. So there are, there are some grassroots movements like that, but I think in the future that there's this big trend now of people coming back to uh, indigenous people and saying, look, okay, you had it, you, 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 uh, just finally understanding like, look, you've had it right for thousands and thousands of years. This last 400 years is this huge aberration. And so that's why there's a big movement back. I'm seeing it in this country towards uh, indigenous people to, to help and support and work with them uh, so that they can lead us back into a better way of living in harmony with the planet.